Okay, hello everyone and thank you for joining us for today's webinar. My name is Diana Ospina and I'll be your host for today. Today's topic is Better Bank Communication Management and Monitoring, presented by Amber Christian. Amber Christian is the founder of ACE LLC, a treasury and cash management consulting firm, and has worked on SAP solutions for over 13 years. She focuses on working capital solutions, implementing accounts receivables, accounts payable, treasury and cash management solutions in North America, South America, Europe, and Asia. She's a frequent blogger and conference presenter on a variety of SAP finance and treasury topics, and she has written for GT News, Treasury Insider, Bob's Guide, and SAP Insider, and is the author of an ebook titled Intercompany Loans, How to Use SAP for Internal Financing. Now, with any further ado, I will now pass this over to Amber to begin her webinar. Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. Thank you so much, Diana, for the kind introduction. So my name is Amber Christian, and as Diana already gave me an introduction, I won't spend too much time introducing myself, but I am the founder of ACE LLC, and I do specialize in treasury, cash management, accounts payable, and accounts receivable implementations, and you can find my contact information here. But since I've got a lot to cover today, we're going to jump right into the topic. So my aim today is to share with you my experiences around how people are doing bank communication management today, you know, how are they managing their interfaces and setting up their projects and their processes. And so my goal here is to give you ideas based on some of the implementations that I've been involved with. And so a real key that we're seeing, or a key trend that we're seeing in, in the bank communication management space is really about automation. You know, we're all trying to do more with less. We're trying to move things in more automated fashion for traceability and trackability purposes. And really moving away from paper-based instruments as much as we can. So it's really about the digitization and, and electronification of payments. So let's face it, there's a lot of different ways that you can implement with your banking partners. And sometimes it feels like there's a long list of choices and you're really not sure where to start. So what I really want to do today is to give you some an opportunity to better understand some of your choices in SAP and how do companies mix and match and put these together and ideas on how some SAP functionality in a module called SAP Bank Communication Management how that can actually make some things easier for you as you implement bank payment interfaces. So the key takeaways is I'll talk about four different ways that I commonly see people integrating for their bank interfaces. Then I'm going to show you a little bit about SAP's bank communication management module for um, payment approvals. And then I'll talk about how to actually approach payment automation projects and just give you some from the trenches advice. I've done implementations for <clears throat> excuse me, about 35 countries at this point in time. So I've done a lot of implementations and seen many different technical designs. So I'll give you some suggestions and just food for thought as you approach your projects. So there is no right payment approval process with the exception of right being whatever it is that your company decides works from an approvals process. I see anything from one approval to three approvals needed for payments. Everybody has sort of their, well, no, 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 this is the right way to do it. And then the next company says, oh, that's not the right way. This is the right way. So everybody has their own right way of doing it. The key is just ensuring that it adheres to any of your Sarbanes-Oxley rules, any separation of duties rules. So there is no one right answer or one perfect practice, and that's a good thing for most people to be aware of. So if we look at what are all of the, the pieces that you think about when you create a payment process, 
There's a lot of ways to pair some of these together. And the choices for what you actually choose for the transactions in SAP will really affect the level of automation you can use in your process. So there's anything from the payment transactions for, say, manual payment clearing, like F-53, or automated clearing in F-110, to the processes for approvals and the actual transfer of files back and forth to the bank. So there's the first component that's really, as an organization, internally facing that you think about. But then there's this other component that you think about as it goes to designing your processes that's really more about, do I want it to be straight through processed once it goes to my bank? Is it a case of the file leaves my building, my network, so to speak, and the bank should just process it? Or do I want more steps on the bank side before things are processed? Then there's also the, the thoughts around how do I manage confirmations? There's a whole multitude of ways you can manage the confirmations process. And a lot of it depends on the capabilities of the partner you're working with. So that could mean that you get confirmation emails back every time a file is sent. Or you can look at things like XML files to give you confirmations at either mail level or individual payment level. So in order to really design your process, the first key takeaway for you is you really have to understand the capabilities that you have with your banking partners throughout the process because that's really going to affect how you put all of these components together and what you can utilize. So what are some of these four common options that I see customers use? The first one is often used in countries or in, in companies where they've got subsidiary countries and maybe they're a small subsidiary. In, in a lot of these cases, you don't have the time to invest in building a bank interface, or maybe you're working with a small local bank, and so there's only a limited amount of automation you can even do. So typically, I see companies with smaller countries often start with a manual payment clearing process, key something on a bank portal, do, a pro do an approvals process on the bank portal, and then get some kind of confirmation. So again, there's still some steps in segregation of duties, but they shift really the tracking and that work onto the bank portal side. And again, it's usually done just due to volume of payments or it might be time needed. And this happens in a lot of cases on sort of country rollouts when you're taking a template and you're just going country to country to country. It's pretty common that, that this is a, a, a standard process. So that's one option, but let's be honest, that's typically the most amount of work because there's a lot of rekeying, there can be failures, a lot of the master data ends up in the bank portals. So this isn't always the best solution, but it's usually the place that a lot of companies start. So a second option that I see in some cases as well, and as you kind of move up the maturity level, you say, okay, well, I want to start to get some automation, so well, where do I start? So in those cases, people will shift from, say, a manual transaction to the F-110 payment program, running payment proposals, reviewing proposals, executing payments, but not quite going all the way toward full automation. And in some of those cases, then they say, okay, well, I'll just manually upload to a bank portal and then do some type of confirmation. So this can be a nice hybrid for companies that may have smaller subsidiaries or aren't, maybe they can't afford or don't have time yet to actually do the bank interfacing project. So this is sort of that second level of sophistication that I often see. The third level, and this is where you really are starting to move in, in the maturity curve toward more straight through processing. The third level is really to say, okay, I'm moving everything into the F-110 payment program. I'm looking at my proposals. I'm doing my reviews. I'm moving things automatically to the bank. And then someone's getting some type of email confirmation. 
This is probably the solution that existed the most for my customers prior to SAP releasing their bank communication management module. And in fact, this option three I still see used in a lot of companies today in their implementations. It gets them some of the, the automated transmissions that they need, but the place that this really falls down is that final step. And that final step is really why SAP created this bank communication management module. The challenge on the business side of this type of solution that I'm showing in option three is really about the uh, being inundated under all of the confirmations. After working with so many banks, in a lot of cases, banks provide confirmations for all the files you transmit. So what happens is it's really easy for someone in Treasury or AP to miss a notification that something actually failed. And that's really where email confirmations can become problematic because in so many cases, the counterparty, the bank, just sends you everything versus exception management. And that really poses a challenge for a lot of shared service and, and treasury types of organizations with option three. So option four is the final one that I see people use. And in this one, oops, sorry, I clicked a little bit ahead there. Okay, in, option four is really about getting these automated confirmations. And this is where you start to see SAP's new um, bank communication management and other tools coming into place, where you can actually move into SAP to do both the payments and the approval process as part of these payment executions, transfer things automatically to the bank, but then get an automated confirmation back. Now, when I say automated confirmation, what you can actually really do is get detailed file level information and, in fact, payment level information about success or failure of payments. So that allows you, through automated confirmations type processes, to move into more of an exception-based process. Okay, so, so how do you actually design a better process and, and what are some of the things to think about? So this is where SAP came out with this module, Bank Communication Management. And so what I want to do is just explain, well, what does this actually do? I mean, why might I think about it? So as you think in the long term about where do you want to be with your banking partners or, or where do you think that you want to go from an automation perspective in the long range, you can think about whether this fits or not for your organization. So what you can do with this bank communication management module is they really have provided a lot of flexibility to allow you to take the appropriate level of steps based on what your organization needs and what your banking partner can provide as well. So one of the first options for BCM and sort of connectivity is you can use this module called Bank Communication Management to do a couple of different things. You can use it to do approvals for payments. So for instance, you could have a certain number of individuals required to be involved in the payment approval process for your payment files before they go out the door. So you could say, we have someone that actually runs our payments programs, and then we add some approval processes, and once those are completed, then we can use middleware, send the files to our bank, and then bring back a confirmation that we can load in BCM. And so that's its second function in BCM. So it can do approvals, and it can track confirmations for those transmitted files in your system. So this is a whole new level of automation, and it does it in dashboards that allow you to actually look at the information and drill into the information. So that's one option. Now another thing that you can do with bank communication management is there's a lot of organizations that build what we call host-to-host -host bank connections. 
And what that means is if I'm connecting host to host, I connect my host, my middleware, to the bank's host. And I do a direct file transfer between me and the bank. Now, if you think about, and let's say you're a large multinational organization. Let's say you've got 15 different banks. Well, boy, that can get really technically complex. There can be a lot there that's involved then when you have to connect separately to all of those different banks. So one of the other things that you see is you see companies like SWIFT, which is a cooperative, that actually sit in the middle where I can actually connect to someone like SWIFT and I can then, SWIFT will then connect to my bank. There are other providers such as eBix in Europe. There's a few different, there's a few different providers that actually have these capabilities um, to do this. SWIFT is the largest one with approximately, I think, 9,000 banks are members of SWIFT, but corporates can also be members. So the best way to think of an, an organization like SWIFT is if I really want to accomplish this concept of a single pipeline, so let's take my previous example of 15 banks around the world. If you did that first option I showed, you'd have 15 different connections from your middleware. What you could do with a provider like SWIFT is say, okay, I'm going to create one connection to SWIFT and they will deal with the 15 connections, one to each of my banks. So for you, it significantly simplifies the amount of connections that you have to build. So this is a common solution that more and more corporates are starting to pursue because they say, I want out of this business of having to care about my connectivity. Let me just go to Swift and then Swift will deal with it for me because Swift is actually the way that the banks all move the files between themselves around the world. Most of the money in the world um, moves actually somewhere through the SWIFT network. Most people just don't realize it because it's a big part of the backbone of the financial system. So this one is becoming much more common because they changed their rules and they've allowed corporates to join. So you're going to start to see more and more corporates ask this question and, and you'd want to think about, well, do I really want to connect to my individual banks or should I go to someone that will be connected to the banks? Different strategies that work for different people. Now the third option that I see people use with bank communication management, this one is less common, but again, it really comes back to what level of automation you can get from your banking partners. In some cases, you may actually want to be able to go ahead and do your approvals processes and tracking inside SAP, but for some reason, you can't automatically connect to the bank and you have to manually move files back and forth. This is less common, but I do see it happen on occasion. You might look at this and say, I have no idea why would I want this bank communication management tool if I was still had to move files back and forth. The reason you might still be interested in it, within this bank communication management tool, you can actually track the approvals that were done. So if you talk to someone in like internal audit and even external audit, they tend to like the module because it allows them to see who actually approved things in the system. So it gives them more comfort that the policies that someone in a treasury organization or a shared services organization gives them and says, oh, well, these are the only people that actually can approve files. Well, you can prove that by actually using the information that comes out of the module showing who did the approvals. So that's something to think about if that auditability of who actually does approvals is extremely important for you. Okay, so a little more detail on you know, what BCM is. So I've spent a lot of time talking about how you can put it in your processes and we talked about the approvals process as well as the tracking. So really this is a module from SAP and this has been out for around eight years but what it is really used for is managing payments and then actually overall status is on bank statements on seeing if all your electronic bank statements have come in. You can use it standalone 
or you can use it in conjunction with um, middleware such as PI, or you can even use some of your own middleware to transfer files. So it performs both payment process approvals, it tracks the transmission of your files, and the transmission of your payments. The place this is really helpful is, you know, the file transmission status, I work on the IT side of things. I, I'm a technologist at heart and have spent years implementing these solutions. And a common refrain before tools like bank communication management came out is, we send a file to the bank, the bank says they didn't get it. And now we're going to fight with the bank, saying, well, no, we sent it. And they said, well, no, we didn't get it. And you end up in this back and forth nightmare um, for businesses uh, of trying to prove who's got the file, where, where did things fall down. What you can do with some of these new tools, such as bank communication management, is you can actually have far greater traceability so that when things leave, you can get statuses that you can update to really answer that once and for all, where's the file question. This has proven to be extremely helpful in most organizations where I've implemented this. Um, the business loves it for the auditability, the traceability, knowing the status of the payments. IT loves it because if something goes wrong, they can look and say, well, how far did it get in the statuses? Oh, and they can see, oh, well, it, it left from my side, but I didn't get the confirmation back. Well, now they know exactly who to call. They see timestamps on things. They know exactly what happened. So everyone likes the traceability and the detail that you can get through this bank communication management module. So now, as you go to think about some of your payment approvals processes, what are some of the decisions that you should make around those processes? So things you would think about is how many approvers do you typically have to have for payments? I see anywhere from one to two in most organizations that I work with until it reaches certain thresholds in which it may be three or more, depending upon, depending upon the size of the transactions. And this really gets back to, you know, what are those limits that are governing the number of approvers that you have to have in your organization? Other things that come into play with bank communication management digital signatures. You can actually use digital signatures um, and to attach those to the batches for particular users. And then you have to think about your internal audit folks and what do they actually want to be able to see. Most of the time when the, I've seen these types of solutions implemented and, and done them myself, it's actually the internal auditors that get the most excited. <laughs> the business says, hey, it helps me do my job easier. IT says the same thing, but the auditors say, yay, I can actually prove who did something. And for, for auditors, you know, that's really a step up from what they usually get. And it puts a lot of comfort around those processes and that security that get, gets put in place. And then finally, the last question to ask as you think about your, your process is, can you even do an automated transmission? Maybe you're in a developing country and working with a small bank, so maybe you actually can't do full automation. So you'll have to think about that as you work through your processes. Okay, so what's it actually look like? I'll give, give you a little bit of a sneak peek, and these are some of the screens um, for this. And this is not off a of HANA system, this is off a system that's on Enhancement Pack 5 or 6, I think, of a classic ECC. I wanted to give you a flavor for, well, how does it actually work? So if you remember in one of those first screens I was talking about how you do your payment approvals, and then you actually will so you do your F110 for most of you that are, or your F111 for you that are transaction based. And then what you do is you do a communication management tool and you create something they call a batch. So you could run all your payments through F110, but maybe you wanted to group them in BCM by say ACH and wires. You wanted different batches for your ACH versus your wires because maybe your approval processes are different. So you come into this transaction and you actually create your batches. Mm -hmm. 
The next thing that you can do is do either approval or rejection of those batches. And then here I'm actually showing where you can use a digital signature attached with it as well. So digital signature simply is just an additional requirement to enter password type information. And this information does get logged by SAP as well when you choose to use those. It's a very simple process. And in fact, for most companies, the entire BCM process is about three or four clicks to create the batch, and then to come in and actually do the approvals. And then in this process that I'm showing, I had a separation of duties. So I had two different users involved in this process. So you can come in and have a second user perform your final approvals. And then once those are complete, a payment file gets created. So it's really a three-step process. I am to run everything through BCM. It can be as simple as a three-step process. In fact, actually, depending on what's required, you can make it even simpler than that. And then the final step is you'll see that SAP will actually create your output in your file and will then send it off if it's an automated transmission. So for those that might be a little, a little more technical, what it really means if you want to use something like a bank communication management is in a classic F110, you can run everything through to clear the AP and AR subledger and then automatically transfer the file. What BCM allows you to do is to put approval steps in between the subledger clearing and the automated file. That's really what BCM is able to do for you. So that's a simple approval process and, and what that would look like in bank communication management. But then here's where the power kicks in. So you might say, so what? I do three extra steps. My business doesn't want to do that. This is the part that they're going to want, and this is the part most IT organizations want. It's that file transmission status. It's being able to say, did the file successfully go to the bank? Did the bank process it? What was the status of the transactions? And it comes in an easier to use monitor, and that's, that's part of the power of it. You know, we're all trying to manage more with less, to, to look at more details, to create things in more dashboards and more summaries. This really comes with that for you already baked in. So there's actually two ways that this can be done from a technical perspective. You, we actually have a confirmations program that can load confirmation files, such as XML files, or there's services. And so you don't, don't really need to worry about the services. I see them used less now, now that some of these other, other programs exist. So this is a key, and one of the, the keys here to loading in these statuses is really giving you that much more detailed information than people have ever had before. And it, it, what does it actually look like from their perspective? I actually decided to give you a couple samples, realize this might be a little technical, but might be good to go back and look at a little bit later. So this, for the first time, banks can start to provide in some of these XML confirmations, they can actually come back and tell you which transactions failed. And the reason that's so valid is when it comes to the next day and it comes to your account reconciliations, you've got to know what the leftover stuff is. And especially when you might have more than one failed payment, let's say you process 500 payments in a group and a couple payments fail. Well, how do you know which ones they are? That poor bank reconciliation person that's trying to come in and actually clear that has got to find the two needles in the haystack that failed. So this is very powerful. When you can actually shift and, and help people move from this perspective of having to look at everything to where you can go to a much more detailed level in the system and say, give me the status on every single payment. Because now my account reconciliation person could see exactly which two were the failures. So when they go to do their clearing and their reconciliation, they know exactly what to pick up and exactly what to reverse. You've really moved them from being sort of 
hen pecking through all the details to being able to laser like focus on what's wrong in order to get it fixed. So it's a big productivity play for people in your treasury organization that are not getting overwhelmed with the emails, people in your IT organization that don't have the finger pointing anymore, and in the accounting organization that have to do those bank reconciliations. Everybody wins with this one when you get this one put into place. So this is actually what the, the status report looks like that can actually read it. I like to give screenshots of the programs. That way people are hunting around like, is this the right one? Well, what did that look like again? So this is simply a, a screenshot to show what the status report looks like. So some of the functions and features of, this, of these status reports and for those that, that care about details. So you can actually bring those files back and forth into the system and read them off of logical directories. And even better in, in bank communication management, they included some of the functions to allow you to archive files off. So once it's read files, it archives them off and doesn't need to reread them. And it really is able to do a lot of the standard reading off XML files, which is really common now for companies to do XML transmissions for their payments and then receive confirmation files. So this, this particular module is absolutely designed to do that, which is really a key trend for corporates. Okay, so we've talked about, about how the IT and the business how basically this is a win for everybody. Instead of it becoming really something that ends up as a, as a challenge for most organizations, you know, it, it moves IT from getting that phone call when there's a question on a transmission to much faster troubleshooting. And for businesses, it, it actually, one of the best things that I've seen for businesses that get really savvy with this when you implement it, and let's be honest, it takes some work to get there with your bank, but they've got the, the various standard XML um, transmissions, but it really lets the business be far more proactive. And I've seen business users go from saying, well, I don't know what happened to that file, to being able to pick up the phone and call their bank and say, okay, I got a confirmation back from you that says you received my file at XYZ time, but you've never sent me a final confirmation what's going on. I've actually watched this in practice and have, that, have the bank go look and go, oh, it got stuck in a queue. So someone on the bank goes and finds the file and pushes it through the process. There was no IT involved in that at all. IT didn't even know what happened. And that was wonderful because you really only want to have to engage your technology folks when there's really a serious failure. The business wants to be proactive. They want to call their bankers. They have the relationships with their bankers. So if there's something comes up, they want to be in the driver's seat there. And for everyone, it's the faster troubleshooting process that is really the big deal. For the accountants, for the treasury folks, shared services, and IT. So some real key things to think about as, as I wrap things up here. As you think about what level makes sense for your organization, Think about the foundation, even if you are doing manual payments, because the reality is for a lot of organizations due to budget constraints or even just the size of certain subsidiaries, you may have manual processes. So the first thing is think about your master data design, even in your manual processes. Make sure you're actually setting up solid master data that you have um, good customer and vendor master processes, that you actually store bank data in the system. Work on your foundation first, because you've got to remember the garbage in, garbage out principle. You can't automate a bad process. One of the hurdles I often run into with organizations when they bring me in to do payment automation is they say, oh, well, we, we only ever stored the master data on the bank portal and getting it out can be a nightmare in some cases. So you really have to focus on, well, do I have processes and do I make sure that I get this into SAP as well? Because that can actually be one of your biggest impediments to automation is if you can actually get it out of the other provider. And a lot of banks don't make it easy <laughs> to get that information exported. So you really have to say, okay, well, do I actually have processes that I know how to get that information out? Or maybe I'm doing dual maintenance in both SAP and on these bank portals because I want to have a foundation there and I know I'm going to automate later. 
Um, and the other thing to be very careful of as you, as you think about some of your payment automation, especially when you have manual processes, be careful about commandeering fields in SAP. Taking fields that may have one purpose and then just using them for your own purpose. This will hang people up often because some of the standard play, payment layouts and things that they'll try to use later will expect certain fields and certain data to be in, in individual fields. And so if you commandeer and start repurposing it, you can actually cause problems. I've seen companies go live with different payment types and they commandeered some fields and just used them for their own notes purposes and they cause payment failures because that's actually not quite what those fields were for. So be very careful about repurposing something unless you really clearly understand the implications if you're going to repurpose it. And then the final thought, even when, you, when you've got some of these manual processes and you're thinking about automating, always keep a backup plan to enter your payments on bank portals. Don't shut down your business user access to this because this is really crucial for disaster recovery take purposes. So you always want to really have two different ways of doing it. An automated way through your systems as well as your banking portals. So payments are the lifeblood of your organization. You know, they, they are the heartbeat. If you can't make payments, you stop your whole supply chain. If you can't take cash in, your your company really really dies. And so this bank communication management really helps you manage that heartbeat and how are things coming and going in terms of things moving in and out of your system. And so that's the presentation that I wanted to run through today on just, you know, what are your choices and options and what do I see companies doing today? If you want to find other tips, I do, as I had mentioned earlier, as Diana mentioned, I do a fair amount of writing and blogging as well. And I do a number of them on uh, SCN. So if you want to read some of those, I do anything from how-to guides to things on strategy. So if you want to read any of those, those are here as well. And so at this point, we will go ahead and shift to there are questions. Great. Thank you, Amber. Um, so yes, I saw that someone raised their hand, so let me go ahead and take a look. Actually, I have two people. Okay, so I have Manny. I'm going to unmute you so you can ask your question. Hello, Manny. Are you there? Okay, it looks like uh, then we'll move over to Jose. Manny, feel free to submit your question in the chat. Um, or you can submit your questions. There's a there's a tab there for you to submit your question. Um, we also have a question or a hand raised here from Jose. Jose, I'm going to unmute you so you can ask your question. The BCN part of the standard ECC module or is part of the treasury module? Um, it's under financial supply chain management, so think of it as more like the treasury module, but it is its own standalone module and it generally has its own set of licensing that goes with it. Thank you. Jose, mm -hmm. did you have any other question? Uh, yes. Okay, go ahead. Um, how the bank validate the digital signature? Ah, the bank, uh, um, the digital signatures get validated inside SAP. So all of that happens um, prior to the transmission to the bank. So it's the, the bank isn't per se validating that signature. Usually the way most people set it up is they may have the signature inside SAP, but then they set up for what we call STP or straight through process upon receiving the file. So they don't actually validate a digital digital signature. Usually, that's how I see it done. Thank you, Amber. Now we have another question here from Pradeep. Will these presentations be available for download? Yes. Uh, yes. Everyone. Yes. Everyone who has attended and who has registered will receive a copy of the webinar slides. Mm -hmm. Next question here from Sunny. Uh, what is the configuration for BCM for one level approval? Um, so for one level approval, the, usually the way people do that is they, they just do the, what they call this um, automated generation. 
and so you would just have that approver create the batch themselves and transmit it. And so there's actually just a little flag in BCM that you can just have that says like automatically transmit it. So there's a little checkbox in BCM in the configuration to do that. So that's how I see people do what we'd call sort of a one level approval um, type process. Okay, thank you. Next question here from Manny. How much of S4 HANA impact BCM? You know, I had, the, I had this question actually a few months ago as well. Not a lot. And really the S4 changes are around um, new modules. So BCM itself is very much, it's the same as it was before. They're at, they'll add new functionality and new modules. And so what they've added, so BCM itself does the same for the approvals processes, but they've added these new functions and features in a module called bank account management that only exists on S4 HANA. And so what bank account management does is you can use BCM that controls the, appro the approval levels and you can check against this bank account management. Think of it as sort of FI12, those that look at house banks, think of it as sort of that on steroids with its own approval processes. So you can enable, a, you can set up approvers for accounts or have them expire in bank account management and then BCM will tie to bank account management. So it's more like there isn't a huge disruption to BCM itself for S4. It's about the new capabilities that get enabled with BCM in the new modules on S4. That, that's how I would think of it. Okay, thank you. And the next question here from Pradeep. We do not have HR master data in our ECC system. How can we set up workflow? Um, so this must be for some type of employee reimbursement type situation. Is that what it is? because um, that's usually when I would see HR data in, a, in an ECC system. Um, what you can do, now this is, we'll get a little bit more technical, but there's actually parts in BCM where you can use something they call a BCM connector. You can actually bring files from other systems in to BCM so you can do the tracking and the transmissions. And so there's actually another product that goes along with this that's called the BCM connector. So this is the BCM module, and then there's an additional connector that lets you bring in other things. So you could bring files from those systems and then have those go through the, the approval and transmission processes. Hopefully, I hope I'm going the right direction. If that wasn't your question, uh, go ahead and, and give me another follow-up. Yeah, he said, uh, no, I want to set up two-level approval flow based on file amounts. Oh, 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 oh okay. Ah. So you, what you do in BCM is you actually create a workflow structure. So this uses SAP workflow. And so you, can, you don't have to have the employees as master data as long as they're users of the system. You can actually have user IDs set up to be the approvers. So you set up individual users that way. So what you would do in a two-step approval process is you could have one set of people that can be the first approvers and then another set that are the second approvers. In fact, they can actually be the same because SAP will automatically take out from the second approval whoever did the first. They actually can't perform it. So you absolutely don't need HR master data. You don't have to have org management at all in order to use BCM and the workflow approvals. Okay, great. I um, have a next question here from Jose. Uh, how does the bank validate the integrity of the file? How can we ensure that nobody touches the file form from us to the bank? Sure. So how you can ensure nobody actually touches the file? You could encrypt it. That's one choice um, as you actually move the file through. Um, that's probably really the only way you could absolutely ensure that nobody touched it um, if you encrypt it. What I usually find, though, is that most people and when they, they add the multiple approvals, but they don't actually add additional security past that because there's a certain level of encryption and, and a, that 
gets added automatically between your channels, between you and your banking partner. But if you were concerned about it or concerned that someone could get in, I mean, let's face it, we know there's hacking and other incidents. And so if you're concerned about that, you could encrypt it. And that would ensure that people wouldn't be able to get in and touch the file. Great. Now I have a question, a hand raised here from Sharon. I'm going to unmute you so you can ask your question, Sharon. Hello? Uh, yes, can you hear me? Yes. I just wanted to ask, will BCN uh, work with for, for large corporations, 10,000 or more employees, Oh, you're, you're a little echoey. Can you repeat that again? It sounded like you got it far away from your mic. I only caught the first part. Could you say that one more time? Can BCN be used for large corporations, 10,000 or more employees with multiple approvers, processes, etc.? Oh, yeah, absolutely. That's normally who I implement it for, very large corporations. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, the, the, a lot of the Fortune 500 typically is, is looking at... And BCM, even going down to the Fortune 1000, yes, that's very normal. The, the key to it is you just have to think about the approval structures. Maybe you need certain groupings of certain types of payments. So you can get pretty detailed in that configuration in SAP in terms of the, how you create the batches and who can approve those batches in order to accommodate exactly what you're talking about. Certain things might need to go through certain groups for, for different types of payments or different countries they originate from, legal entities that are involved. You get to do what SAP calls create your own batching rules that then dictate how you group them and who gets them for the approvals. So it's, it's intended for, very, for large corporations um, to use. Great. Thank you. And we'll take one last question here as we're over time. If you have any other questions that haven't been addressed, please feel free to contact Amber directly or we will address them after this webinar. The last question here is from Sunny. Is the PAIN, P-A-I-N, file you showed for payment file, is it configurable like any other DME files? Ah, so the one that I was showing you was what you would receive back from the bank. Now, if you're, if you're thinking of the um, actual payment file, yes, you can absolutely configure that in DMEE. But on the inbound side, what you have to do is you use something that, sorry to get technical, you can use an XSLT to actually read it. So you can create rules. It's not quite like DMEE. Um, you have to have a developer if you have to move things around, but you can do some interrogation of it using um, XSLTs when you bring those files in. Great. Thank you so much, Amber. Um, that's it for our time today. We will address all the questions that we did not uh, get to answer during this webinar. Uh, Amber will follow up with you or I'll follow up with you directly. Um, thank you again for your time. Um, and uh, we welcome you to our next upcoming webinar. You'll all be notified via our newsletter. Please feel free to check out our uh, LinkedIn social group. Thank you, everyone, for attending. Have a nice day.